Hello and welcome everybody to the weird world of knowing. I am Rachel Earing, your host for the day, and today we have a beautiful guest. And I don't know I say the word beautiful a lot, so I'm just going to cover that for you. The word beautiful really does make people smile. And my whole journey is to try and make people smile as much as possible and to dig in deep to get that real essence of who somebody is and for me that word cannot be used enough to help people feel good about themselves because this really is what this show is all about so this beautiful guest that i have today tina wright tina hello and welcome hi rachel lovely to be here oh it's a joy to have you here so Tina, you are a chronic pain and anxiety expert. So you've come across some really weird and wonderful stories with your clients, but also you came through that journey with your own sorts of issues like we all have. It sort of put you on this path to, to go and do that. So you were an accredited CBT psychotherapist, mindfulness teacher, and you suffered from generalized anxiety disorder. Yes. Fibromyalgia, IBS, TMJD, and severe migraines. Now, what is TMJD for those people who do not know what that is? That's temporomandibular joint dysfunction, and it's the jaw where it can sometimes get stuck, uh, often open, and it's really, really painful. And it, it, it's you get referred to a you know, ENT specialist and there is sometimes, you know, you're sometimes referred for surgery, etc. But it, it's, yeah, it's where the, the jaw really just gets stuck in that awful position or it just hurts so much so you can't eat sometimes mm -hmm. talking hurts and for me. That was horrible. Yeah, you know, I like to talk. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was really you know, quite difficult for quite a while was to having those symptoms. So how, I know that you've now sort of recovered from, from most of these things. So that's weird in itself because obviously most people, you know, who have fibromyalgia for a bit, have it for, for, for years and years and years and, and mm. stuck in that, that that pain threshold without being able to function. And yet here you are, you know, vibrant and <coughs> working in the best possible way, plus helping others. So can you explain to us a little bit about your background and your journeys, what these weird things that have brought you to where you are now? Yes. So I was working in the NHS as a psychological therapist and I had the um, diagnosis of fibromyalgia, but I was in pain a lot of the time, but I started to explore mindfulness for work reasons, mainly, you know, I'd read the, re re uh, the literature, the research was saying, you know, it was good for a lot of things. And I put myself forward to train in this, you know, to be able to help my clients, you know, my patients within the NHS. And so I, I went on training course and did a lot of work and we went on a couple of retreats. The first retreat was really quite a, yeah, yeah, sort of quite heady, you know, it was more the academic side and I continued to learn a lot about it, learn how to teach it and took quite a few classes, you know, with patients, yet it was still found it very academic. Yeah, you know, it was, I was doing mindfulness. I was doing the practice. So I was meditating as expected uh, on a daily basis but it felt like i was doing it rather than being it yeah yeah i don't know you know it depends whether you know that's a very hard concept to understand if you've not meditated or <laughs> you know but there's a difference between knowing something in your head and feeling it in your heart yes we we often get caught up in our heads uh, especially I think in Western societies, we, yeah, we taught a lot of academic stuff. You know, our schooling system is all based on academic achievement. Our whole medical system is taught on academics, you know, and what works and what doesn't work and not explored emotionally about how you feel. 
And so we are trained from early life to just think about things rather than feel things. And so that's what I was doing, was just thinking it and doing it rather than feeling it and being it. But it was the second retreat that we went on, which was in a lovely country house. In October, it changed. It changed everything for me. How? What happened? Well, the first morning of waking up there, I was quite disgusted, to be honest, because we were woken by a gong at the break of dawn. Got a nice bed, but they want me out. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Gosh. But I had to get up. We were all sort of taken out onto this lawn, which was, you know, covered in dew because it's an October morning, you know, light was hardly there, you know, it was, it was quite mystical really, you know, sort of, uh, the mist was hovering, bloody freezing calm, standing and expected to do this Qigong exercise, it's very slow moving. And we were slapping ourselves to start with up our arms and legs and then doing this routine of very slow movement. Well, considering I was hurting all over through fibromyalgia, my hands in particular used to hurt so much to type. Sometimes I'd be sat at my desk just crying when I had to type up reports. And so actually even, you know, tapping myself was really sore and hurting my hands. There's certain parts of my body that really hurt just doing that. And I could not coordinate my head with my hands, you know, and to get my feet to just bring my, my leg to bring my foot up within time with my hand, it was like, I can't do this. I was just like, what the bloody, we're here to meditate. Why are you making me do this first thing in the morning? <laughs> I was furious, everybody. I was furious at, you know, the people that had organized it. I was furious at the man that was taking the class, but everybody else, because they seemed to be able to do it. Yeah, I was getting so, but we ended up having to do this every day. We were meditating during the day and doing other classes and you know, there was poetry and all sorts. And I was like, I don't understand what's going on here, but through the week, something happened. It seemed to change. And at the more I went to these morning, first thing in the morning classes, there was a difference happening. You know, I get so angry with myself because my body would not work. My body did not do what I wanted it to do. My head worked perfectly okay. I could take in information. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people talk about fibro fog and not being able to concentrate and things. I wasn't really affected in quite that way. And that, you know, I know that fibro affects people in very different ways. And, you know, so I was quite lucky in that way, but I've, I, I was sort of getting so frustrated. I could not think my way out of this. You know, I could not take in the instructions and then follow them because my body followed them. So I journaled, I journaled about this experience and my journal, I, I kept it because, well, I keep lots of my journal, but I kept it because it is a record of my transformation in, in effect, because it when I look back, I can see just how angry I was at me, but not at internal me. It was my body. I was angry at what my body could not do. I was angry at all the hurt it held from years. Various different things have happened. Yeah. I was just so enraged and I never realized how angry I was until that moment. And it was scary. It was really scary to have that rage, but never realized I could be that angry, that incensed about so, you know, that's so, so like, yeah, to know that, that and to admit it to yourself, that was like another thing, revolutionary in a way, because by the end of the week, it was like, okay, maybe it's what I need. Maybe it's because, you know, I need to release this and by the end of the week, I'm more accepting. My body, it wasn't that I was in that place. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't my body that was stopping me from doing it. It was the way I felt that was stopping me really. And it was the, by the end of the week, I, I moved myself from my head into my body. Yeah. You know, I wasn't thinking about it anymore. I was feeling it last morning before we left, you know, the session, 
it was like, I didn't think, oh, I need to move this arm in time with this leg and step this way and turn this way. The mo movements just flowed from within. Yeah. As if my body then just allowed me to do it. I didn't think, I didn't need to think. And it was just, I had tears rolling down my face. I was like, I actually like my body and because it can do it. It wasn't that it couldn't do it, it can do it. But because I was in my head, I wasn't allowing it to do and be, was made to do and be. In the stories we tell ourselves stop us from being who we are meant to be. You know, that is such a powerful story, Tina, because until we sort of make that connection with head and, and head and body, we don't understand it. We can't, we can't, it's an experience, isn't it? It's an experience of actually being con connected, all of us connect. <laughs> and the freedom it sort of allows your body to flow with only, only you will know what that meant to you, but there is that knowing it's such that deep knowing of acceptance of, I need to release this. I need to accept this. And your body's relief, I suppose, in that gave yeah. the freedom and the freedom to move with, without pain, I presume. Was that without? Yes. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was like, I mean, I wouldn't say without any pain, you know, achy muscles as if you've done a workout, you know, it was still like different sort of, it was more acceptable pain because it was choice pain. You know, it was like I had chosen to move that way. And I was accepting that pain because it hadn't moved that way before for so long, or, you know, not before, but for so long mm. that it was going to hurt. You know, I'd lifted my knee up higher than I had for probably 10 years. So I was going to hurt around the buttocks and, and you know, my thighs were going to ache and that was okay. It wasn't the almighty pain. Uh, you know, it, it was more of an ache, a muscular ache that you would expect if you would mm. you know, perhaps be to the gym. So it was a different feeling and it, it was, a, you know, it was then I'd made the decision, you know, I can't stay just working with people's minds and their thoughts and doing just a, a cognitive approach, you know, a CBT approach. It, you know, I still love CBT and I use it an awful lot. You know, I think there is a lot to benefit from it um for a lot of people but it's not the only way and it's not you know it's, it's you know we can use some of it but we can take it from other ways as well you know and that's why and that's I, I decided think, yeah I think sometimes these modalities they're, they're much better when they're blended together with something else aren't they so yeah they become really effective and if people could be a little bit more open-minded and, and, and happy to actually just, you know, perhaps go with CBT, but actually you might, there might be some hypnosis in there or uh, some tapping or whatever it is that actually helps the, all of that process flow through with that client in the most freeing of ways. It's a really beautiful experience. I think you've just, gosh, you've explained it so perfectly because that weird world of knowing that's unique to you as you're experiencing that with your yeah. body and what that actually felt like took you on that journey to doing what you do now. And of course you're helping other people understand their own weird world of knowing, aren't you? So how, how is that working out? Can you get, that's, well, that's it. I mean, I made that decision in that week that I needed to set up my own business. I could not carry on working within an NHS system. And I love the NHS. We're lucky to have the NHS, mm. but it is constricting, yeah. you know? And so I, I made the decision by the end of that week that I would need to leave. And, you know, so yeah. So now I, I do have the CBT arm, which, you know, if someone wanted pure CBT, they could have that, you know? But I do also offer courses and workshops and free group and, you know, various other one-to-one um, -one work as well for people with chronic pain, stress illnesses. So now this is different from Kui Kong, isn't it? So how does, how do yeah. you are doing now help people feel freer from pain with what you do? Can you give us examples of some clients that you've worked with yeah. pain thresholds? One, one lady, you know, that 
comes to mind, she was one of the early clients I worked with. She had chronic back pain. She'd fallen down the stairs 20 years earlier, had had all sorts of tests within the NHS, and an MRI scan had shown that there was these dark patches on her scan. And a doctor had apparently told her that there was some nerve damage. And she had perceived that to mean that, you know, she would never recover. She came to the clinic with, you know, my, my clinic with two walking sticks, bent over, her husband helped her in. She was wearing slippers. She couldn't bear to put shoes on because the whole of her lower body was in real bad pain. So she, you know, was in pain from the waist down the lower spine that had been affected and talked and it was the conversation went that you know she she had this belief that you know back the nerves in her back were dead because she'd seen the imaging that showed black parts and she took that to mean that those you know, nerves were dead so part of what we work with is the beliefs and part of what I work with are also the emotions. So from the belief side, her belief was that her nerves had died. So straight away, it's like, well, if they had died, would you be able to walk? You know, if you had no nerves there, what happens? You know, and she had just accepted her belief. She accepted what she had perceived the doctor said and what the, she perceived the image into have meant and never questioned it because we know from research and we know from our own experiences, very rarely do we question authority. Mm. We accept, and men in white coats tend to be, you know, we accept white males as the authority. That's what happened, especially at, this isn't meant to be disrespectful, but some people of a certain age as well, she was slightly older and she respected the medical profession to know best. So she had just taken, what she believed his words were as the gospel truth. And that was that. So once she sort of started questioning her belief, it started to undermine what she had believed mm -hmm. because she could see that actually, if she had had that, you know, as much damage or, you know, the fact that the nerves weren't, you know, gone completely, then, or if they had gone, she wouldn't be able to walk at all. So that wasn't true. We then looked at what actually happened in her life at that time, which is the key question. And anybody who has any chronic pain, any illness or stress related condition can ask yourself that, you know, and I know from my variety of different diagnoses, which is really, I hate using the word because it's too medicalized, but with various different conditions that we um, get labeled with. Again, don't like labels, but um, if you can go back to the root, you know, when did they start? What was happening in your life at that time? And it's usually quite clear, but it can take a little bit of digging. In this lady's case, she was actually on holiday with her sister and she had recently, you know, and that's when she fell down the stairs, she had recently found out that her husband had had an affair. And this was the same husband that had brought her to the clinic that day. He had stayed with her for 20 years and he was nursing her. She knew that he'd had an affair and was having difficulties of back pain recovering because of the distraught nature of, you know, her relationship, you know. And the back very often signifies support. Lower back is very often tied in with lack of support. Yeah, isn't it? It's that exactly that you know. And what would happen if 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 she didn't need him anymore? Yeah, and if he was to leave, she would not have that support. Like her back was not supporting her. And once she re realised that. And, you know, with learning some relaxation techniques and getting her to move a little bit because of, you know, the, the way she'd carried herself for so long, you know, the same with me, you know, she had some aches and pains, but they were then understandable aches and pains and she could safely move and know 
she was safe and supported. I mean, we had a session with her husband eventually and he, you know, they were both in tears and, you know, they still loved each other. Yeah. You know, and that was lovely. You know, so they were able to then go and work on their relationship, knowing that the support was there. For them. And she walked out on the last day without her sticks. Oh, beautiful. It's lovely. And, you know, and, you know this, this weird world of knowing, we sometimes shut off, don't we? We shut off in many, many ways to protect ourselves. So it, the weird world that we're calling of knowing is actually a remembrance. It's, it's coming to terms with, you know, what we already knew, but we've just packed away and hidden it and shoved it back down and stuffed it back down. Well, what might happen if it comes out? It's that fear of what happens if it's on show. Yeah. What yeah. happens to me? And so relate to that, you know, it's, it's really beautiful examples that you've given us on, on these weird world of knowings, because as we start to dig deeper, we, the, the treasures that are in within each and every single one of us gives us freedom physically, yeah. emotionally, exactly with all aspects of our life, don't they? Yeah. That's it. The body knows the score. The body does know the score, yeah. you know, and it's funny because my, I, I know that my body has a tendency to lead me rather than my, rather than my head sometimes. And it can get me into all sorts of predicaments. People would say, I say that I'm just led by my own intuition and my gut instinct. And I'd very much feel everything. Uh, and that is what an empath for those people who are empaths, you know, you do sort of feel other people's emotions, but there's ways of dealing with it. There's ways of, um, understanding it and the more conscious you become of actually what is happening. And I think more and more people are now since the pandemic, we've all had this time on our own and we know that certain environments bring back those feelings again, because that's other people's stuff, not necessarily yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So we're getting more in tune with ourselves and remembering things. Um, but trust it, you know, really do trust mm -hmm. it. Ask, ask yourself questions that you might never normally ask yourself. Well, why, why is that pain there? What is it? And then just sit and see what happens. And you might get some really strange and weird, wonderful answers. But if you can give yourself a day of following through on those questions and going and experiencing what that might mean, it might mean that you need to get in the car and go to a certain place for a walk. What, if you've got a day, why not just go and experience and what that might mean on that walk for you to experience what's happening on that walk. Are your legs heavy? Are your legs heavy at a particular point? Is there, ask your body then what, why are my legs heavy at this particular point? What is going on? Is there something I need to look at? See, just let me know. And you'll be surprised at the really <laughs> weird and wonderful answers that you'll get from <laughs> remembrance and what peace it will make into that mi missing jigsaw pieces of your life will start to fit together. And I know that might sound weird and wonderful, but, um, try it. It's taken me on quite a few journeys. I must say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've been deeply, for, deeply, deeply profound, but I'll go into that into another, in another show. Yeah. So Tina, what advice would you give people just going into the working environment, whatever working environment that is, whether that's, you know, people coming out of university school or people transitioning into a completely new workplace or new role or new career or mm -hmm. starting a career for the first time. What key advice, knowing what you know now, would you give somebody? To ask for what you need to, you know, first know what you need. So be in tune with what you need, ask yourself what you need and then ask for what you need. You're entitled to have what you need. You know, that's the thing that we very rarely remember. And you know, we're all entitled to that. We're all entitled to, to have our needs met. And that might not be the, as everybody else. It might be that you need a room that you could go to for peace and quiet throughout the day. You know, I know for myself, I had to work in an open plan office. That did not suit. Mm. I, you know, I found it was too overwhelming working in an office like that. I know I could have been a lot more productive working in a, in an office separate or working from home. You know, I much prefer working from home. 
So, you know, it's knowing and, and if you can, you know, find, find ways of checking out what's good for you. If, if you've never done it, try it and see, but be mindful. And if it does make your pain more difficult or your symptoms or your stress, find space and time in each day to just get that little space for you. So even if you're not given enough, maybe at lunchtime, go for a walk or as you pop to the toilet, that's a, that was a favorite toilet breaks. You've got two minutes, maybe in the toilet, do some deep breathing, take some time to just check in with your body. How am I feeling? Check in with your mind. What's going on here? And just be for those two minutes, every couple of hours, it's just a way of recalibrate oh tina i'm relaxing as you're talking like this you know i can feel my own, own body sort of relaxing deeper and deeper you've just got that really beautiful voice to go with <laughs> just perfect thank you um uh, one last question for you before we go tina um who would you like to listen to on the weird world of knowing who do you know who might have some weird knowings that they could share with us who do I know? Oh, I actually spoke to someone this week who may well, do you know what though? I can't remember her surname as we talk. That's okay. <laughs> the name's Samantha mm -hmm. and I can tell you her group mm -hmm. if you would like. Absolutely. Yeah. Why would you want Samantha to come on the show? She's so lovely, ugly. She, she's actually has fibromyalgia diagnosis and we spoke about labels. Um, and I think, you know, I said to her, it's the first time I've actually met her this week online. Um, but we've been corresponding and actually she's a kindred spirit. She understands where we're coming from, um, as in tapping into things and she has her own journey that she could bring in and she helps, she does a lot of work with uh, youth charities in Scotland. And I think um, she probably has a lot to, to offer. And I love the fact that it's somebody that, you know, who isn't one of these great big names out there. This really is podcast really is about bringing the homegrown body from all walks of life, because we're all on a journey and people that you know, and you love, and that you're going to meet in your life, they're going to have more more profound effect on you than the people who are, you know, the big names out there. I, I think Be aware of these people that are coming into your life because they come in and they, they have these real nuggets for you. We relate more to people that are like us. Mm. We like people like us. So, yeah, you, know, you know, we need to you know our greatest teachers are usually nothing like us at all. Teachers are the ones that we yeah. the clash the most with. We yes. can't get True. angry with, and then need to try and find some peace within ourselves to mm -hmm. that. So, and even if that's you, <laughs> you know, and we all get angry with ourselves, but exactly, which is why we learn so much from our body when we don't like. Absolutely. <laughs> learn to fall in love with yourself because you yeah. yourself, there's only you on this journey with you so <laughs> your whole life. So yeah. Not learn to love every single part of you that's it as tina is doing and tina you've just been an awesome guest thank you so much you brought so much value with your stories to connecting mind and body and why that is important and the freedom that that gives so i can't thank you enough thank you for being with us thank you anyone who wants to get in touch with tina the details will be down below in the podcast but tina just let us know where people can get in touch with you so on Instagram, it's, um, I've got a free Facebook group for anybody that is, um, experiencing any stress illnesses and that's beyond the label, chronic pain, stress illness and TMS. Fantastic. Thank you, Tina. And take care everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening on the weird world of knowing. I do hope you enjoyed your time with us. I'm Rachel Ewing, your host. And gosh, I'm having a ball putting all of this together for you. So I hope you are too. And if you are, please do like, subscribe and share with those who might actually benefit from these weird moments of knowing as they realise how many of their own they've been having all their life. Take care and we'll see you next week. <laughs>